Thank you, John. Thank you. I'm just going to stay down here. Thank you very much. Nice of you. Thank you. Well, good morning. Thank you very much. It's, it's good to be in Massachusetts. I have to tell you, uh, uh, your tax dollars are well spent. It's, uh, I was driving from Boston, Logan, last night at, uh, after 1 o'clock in the morning, and there are cops on the road. So you're good. You know, you're, you're in a good state. I'm happy for you. And they are, they are very serious workers. There are cops there. And uh, I was trying to speed a little bit, but couldn't work. So uh, anyway, so uh, uh, thank you. It's, uh, it's, uh, Massachusetts, do you guys know that you are uh, one of the highest pizza uh, scoring states? If you were a country, you would have beaten Finland. So, well, unfortunately, you're not a country. So uh, sorry about that. And uh, they, uh, I was actually looking at some of the major achievements uh, recently been talking about. PISA is definitely one of them, right? And uh, uh, what other achievements do you have in Massachusetts? Well, you are the one of the most uh, messed up states in education policy. That's another achievement you should be aware of. As, uh, uh, they are, well, seriously. So it's, uh, they, but anyway, I think today was uh, many of you are in technology and education. Most of you are perhaps uh, tech directors and teachers of technology, right? Is that uh, I don't know if that class is still on, right? Uh, we've got rid of most of it because of no child left behind, and uh, so you've uh, you've been in this field, judging from your hairs, have been for for a long time. Most of you, it's, uh, I, I can see. We're talking about Lotus Notes, right? No, yeah. <laughs> Lotus Notes, how many of you know Lotus Notes, right? Are you still using that? Well, then that's, you're not really vintage, but uh, the, uh, I've been in technology field for a long, long time. Seriously, I started uh, playing with the computers in 1985. Okay, that's a long time. And uh, my first job, I was actually a student in China at that time. I was writing computer programs to teach people how to memorize Massachusetts. I don't know, you, you seriously, it's one of the hardest kind of states to spell. Do you know that? It's, a, it's that why, that's why I was trying to teach people using computers to do it. And uh, now with my iPhone, I still don't know how to spell it. I just call it mass. Uh, now, the, with technology has been going on for so long. You know, how many years now? How many transformations? And then I was uh, 1995, I was at University of Illinois playing with the first version of Mosaic. How many of you know Mosaic? Okay. And I was actually trying to write a, a, a web browser. And I wrote one, but it didn't really work, and Netscape took over. Somebody else made more money. And I've always been kind of following other people. Uh, but think about all those generations. Honestly, today, if you ask yourself, has technology transformed education? We probably say no. It haven't been transformed. But who to blame? That's the question. Definitely not you, you know, it's not you. I would have blamed George Bush. <laughs> I, I, think, uh, I, I think so, I'm serious. I, I would blame Obama too. It's that, so actually what has happened all this time? I think today we all, I want to really guide us through thinking about why hasn't technology transformed education? Not changed, transformed. As you know, every three or five years, you get some money, you buy some new things, right? It's, uh, you know, we're talking about one-to-one -to -one today. We were talking about one-to-one -one 10 years ago. You know, there were one-to-one -one 10 years ago. Uh, and there, actually, in my village, we were, there were, we're trying to do one-to-one -one, uh, 30 years ago. That's one pencil per student. That's one-to-one, -one, right? It was hard to get. It's, uh, and uh, we're doing a lot of one-to-ones. And we were doing connectivity. Remember Apple Talk? Some of you may have heard, remember ACOT, Apple's Classroom of Tomorrow? Remember all those, those days? It's a, we have done a lot of different things. We've spent a lot, a lot of money. And today we're spending a lot, even a lot more money in, in this area. Why we haven't achieved? Well, I think ultimately the, the reason is that uh, we probably have been talking about the wrong type of education, educational goals. I think I read that on your introduction, you were talking about the new flavor this week, this month, is called the Common Core, right? It's a, do you know the Common Core? Everybody knows about the Common Core? Okay, if you don't know, you're not uh, supposed to be living in Massachusetts, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, the Common Core is a very interesting concept. It's, it's um, 
basically, I have been writing a lot about the Common Core. I've been one of the most vocal critics of the Common Core. And most people try to uh, say that uh, um, I don't know enough to criticize it. I said, are you joking? China has been had a Common Core since for 2,000 years. <laughs> That's the imperial exam. The emperor said, I shall demand this on all people who wants to obtain a job. That's common and core. That's the whole thing. It's, uh, and, uh, but what's actually interesting, I, I have uh, debated a lot of people. Most people think, you know, I don't like it. I don't understand it. They think, uh, well, I said, you know, basically, I read all common core stuff. And uh, more importantly, I said, it's that the concept itself is constraining the power of technology. Uh, I, I was telling Mark Tucker, uh, the guy who uh, from the you know the major leader and uh, proponent of the Common Core, I said uh, I would be completely fine with the Common Core if they are not common or core. Uh, 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 it's the problem is the common and the core. Why is that? Because it's trying to define education as a homogenization process to ensure everybody acquires the same thing at the same time in the same rate. And technology, whenever you implement your technology, has always been forced to produce that results. That's always, remember you always have to justify the school board meetings. Did this improve our test scores? What does improvement mean? Improve means, improvement means moving the average up and reduce the variation. Is that right? That's, that's, so it's an average. So how do you get there? How do you get? It's actually a very simple process. You, uh, uh, you try to get rid of those people who are not good at this stuff. You kick them out. That's how you, you select students. That's number one. Seriously, you do. And number two, you try to, uh, uh, re uh, try to force everybody to study the same thing. Uh, you probably need a technology. I don't know about your expo. I should have looked at uh, your, your expo stuff, you know. You know, look, most technology products have nothing to do with education. They're all with to do with teaching and instruction. With forcing people acquiring the same thing. So which, of course, can cause serious problems. That is, uh, we are still thinking education as a factory. We want to produce exactly the same people, the same products. And that, technology can do a great job with. So I think over the, all these years, you can blame Bush, you can blame, actually no, today you can blame Obama, or Chris Christie, it's another guy to blame. It's a, and uh, it's all of these things is what basically have the, the goal we're pursuing. And why are we pursuing the wrong goal? Today, we talk about the Common Core. And the goal of Common Core is what? It's about college and career readiness. Now, is that a worthwhile goal to pursue? Or is that even a pursuable goal? Today, when you use technology to implement the Common Core, you've got to think about that. And is education truly trying to prepare somebody to get a job? Or actually, can you read into this word, prepare someone to get a job? Uh, I came here late, late last night. It's because I was in uh, Chicago. Uh, the Shakespeare Theater had an event. So they had me and uh, an art professor uh, talk about this with uh, um, someone from NPR over there. So that's why the end late I flew over here. And we actually had an interesting conversation about the goal of education. A lot of teachers and uh, Chicago area people, the uh, birthplace of Arnie Duncan, and uh, if you remember him. And uh, so uh, well, one of the things I was actually, my son was in the audience. He's, uh, he's not working for the arts club. Uh, my son is an interesting character. And he's, uh, he's not like any other most Chinese people, good Chinese. He did not major in banking or economics or medicine. As a Chinese kid, he majored in art, which is uh, kind of problematic for uh, psychological and troublesome, you know, uh, and uh, for, for him. And, uh, well, seriously, seriously, seriously. Uh, and we are, I mean, he just graduated in uh, June. This is very relevant to what we think about. And he was ready for college. He went to a boarding school in New Jersey after uh, no child of behind, actually yanking him out of public school in Michigan to a boarding school. So he was good enough. He, he was college ready. And he was ready for one, one of the most expensive colleges, University of Chicago. You know. and, but he was uh, not ready to get any scholarships. I got to pay everything. That's, uh, uh, <laughs> when you have kids, that's the worst kind of kids, right? They, they're good enough to get into something, but not good enough to get something for free. That's the, uh, <laughs> And then, then he, uh, 
he, he, he was majoring in art, and he was in June. He was uh, June fifteenth. He graduated, and uh, good conversation about educational purposes. Uh, he spent a lot of my money. You have to say that it's that. What does it mean? He was feeling really horrible. He said, "You know, Dad, you know, I'm a, I'm a Chinese kid. Uh, you got. I was going back to China to explain, uh, you know, to tell all my." My re- visit my relatives. He was worried how are you going to explain to your Chinese relatives that your son majored in art. Uh, because in Chinese, Chinese culture, this is very true, Chinese culture says that um, only you are, when you cannot major in anything else, you choose art. Okay, so that's, that's because it's soft, right? It's the periphery, it's not the common or core stuff. And uh, so you naturally feel it as a failed Chinese kid. Remember the Tiger Mom book, all those kind of things? And uh, I say, no, don't worry about it. You may be a failed Amer- a Chinese, but you can be a successful American. It's a, you know, it's a, uh, the, uh, I mean, after all, I told him, I said, uh, I am a failed peasant. Seriously, I grew up in a Chinese farm in China, a little Chinese village. And my, all my families have been generations, been peasants. I was a failure to them. I couldn't do this stuff. You know, so I, I'm glad I can come to Western Mass to talk to you, you know, if there is something else. But I told him, I said, as long as you can stay out of my basement, you've got a good education. <laughs> and so that's, uh, uh, that's my definition. Uh, out of the basement, readiness. <laughs> out of the ba- Now, question, do you know how successful we are in moving our, our kids out of our basement? Not very. Do you know that? Not very successful. I got some stats, actually, uh, if I can pull it up. Uh, the, uh, basically, the story is this today. It's very sad. Okay, 53% of our recent college graduates are not having a full time job uh, in their parents' basement. So, college readiness is not good. Actually, you, we, because when you send a lot of kids into their parents' basement and with a college debt, on average, $23,000 per student. That's not happy. And this is not an American phenomenon. So don't blame Obama. And it's a global phenomenon. Uh, I have even more data, which I'm not going to show you, but it's just basically, trust me, uh, 25% of students, youth, in European countries do not have jobs. That's 45% in Spain, probably. And South Africa, Korea, China now graduates 7 million college students a year. You know, that's like basically graduates about the half of the state of Massachusetts. It's, uh, and can you believe how 7 million? And most of them do not earn a migrant worker's wage. It's, uh, it's very, very hard, all this situation. College students not getting jobs. And at the same time, America has another problem. That is, uh, we have um, a shrinking middle class, the U.S. Do you know the U.S., the shrinking middle class is a room? You can't find these guys. Okay. You know, over the last 30 years, America has been losing its middle class. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the problem. Uh, we, we are a nation built on middle class. So what has happened is the top uh, income people have growing and the bottom been growing. So what's the story here? The story basically is we've been pursuing the wrong type of education, the r- wrong education. That is, education has always been responsible for producing the middle class. And those are the college students. But they are not becoming middle class, they're becoming middle class burdens. Okay? And now, our job is produce the next generation middle class. If we cannot do that, we probably will feel very miserable in the future. It's, uh, th- that's what happens. So what is the, the story here? The story is very simple, actually. It's uh, economies change and because of technology change. Technology changes, and technology changes redefine the value of talents and knowledge. It's a very simple story, the value of talents. And today, um, now we think reading is such a big deal, right? We think literacy is essential. That was, was that essential before Gutenberg? No. 
You know, so you should all blame your illiteracy problems on Gutenberg. <laughs> you know, damn Gutenberg, you have to invent the thing. You know, that's a, if you didn't, you don't have to read. Do you, do you know that? I, th I remember a time, uh, 1996, I went to Michigan State University to work. And at that time, people, professors were still debating, do we really need to use email? My dean, for my dean, I was hired as a professor to help other professors to use email. And there was actually a professor who brought in a rock into my dean's office to say, I am going to use this, you know. That's, that's it. It's, I almost got fired for that reason, just trying to pro push down email. Nobody would have, th have thought at that time, not nobody, very few people thought email would be a required talent for somebody, right? It's a, and I think that at that time, people can be proud. Well, I don't want to jump on the latest bandwagon. I don't care about that email. Today, would you hire anybody to say, I don't, ha I don't use email? <laughs> you know, like someone apply for a job, can I email? You know, I don't use email stuff. You, know? you can't do that anyway. So technology always defines the value of talents. Always defines the value of talents. In my little village, in my little village, driving the water buffalo was the common core. That, that was, yeah, if you, you have to be able to drive the water buffalo. That was, but reading was not required at all. You can't read to the water buffalo to walk. You can, there's no way to do that. It's, uh, that was just not part of the deal. It's, uh, so I, I, was, uh, I was not very useful. You know. So think about how knowledge changes. Dyslexia, dyslexia, we still consider a problem to most of us today. And dyslexia uh, is actually a brain condition, a different kind of neuron wiring, and therefore uh, it causes trouble in people's deciphering 2D spaces. So they may have literacy reading issues. But dyslexic people, their brain wiring are very good for artistic perceptions, perception of depth and artistic patterns. So they are very good at identifying star patterns. Do you go out at night? I don't know how many of you, I have a very hard time thinking the moon is even round. I, I can, I, I say it's flat. But those people can see it's actually round. There's different layers of stars. For me, I couldn't do it. It's, but that was not very useful talent. Remember 100 years ago? Well, the best job for you if you can read the sky, that's a witch, you know, Salem. <laughs> Right? That's, uh, and, uh, but uh, anyway, so that, but today, there's a lot of jobs for dyslex dyslexic talent. It's a talent now. Why? Art, 3D design. If you play, uh, do you play in a Grand Theft Auto? Do you guys play those games? You know how much money they make, those guys, right? You know what they're about? It's visual manipulation. And that talent wasn't useful. But now, there's a bunch of Scot Scots guys actually in Scotland, the Grand Theft Auto. Uh, I, I can't believe how much money they're making in you know, little talent. And art, and also astrophysics. That requires talent. So talent shifts. And education should always try to anticipate the changes of those. But education has always been behind technological changes. Therefore, technology. Technological shifts, when it first happens, always cause misery to a lot of people. We replace people. That's very simple. You replace, you render old talent useless. Remember Henry Ford's cars come along? Those horseshoe makers were miserable. Serious horseshoe makers, you know, they were, actually they did, actually threw car, stones on the cars driving by. They hated us, the stuff. It's, uh, it's, it's, they seem to sabotage those machines until they said, we can't really stop this. Let's go become a car mechanic. Changes. So this is what uh, most of education people talk about. It's called the race between technology and education. The race between technology and education. So the race is this. When technology defines, a few people can catch up to it. Then the masses move on. Once we can catch up with it, we live a relatively good life. The last time um, major shift happened was in the Industrial Revolution. 1867, uh, Henry uh, Herbert Spencer, is a British philosopher, he wrote this very interesting essay. If you are on, on your device, you can search for it. Called, what knowledge is of most worth? What no 
That's industrial revolution. Remember the schools, what schools were teaching? The schools were teaching the common core at that time. And the common core was Latin, Greek, grammar, and the Bible, probably, right? That you, you, and if you're old enough to remember 1860s, I doubt you have. But anyway, so uh, those things, are they very useful for the industrial society, industrialized society? No. They were good to be, to be a pretentious gentleman living in the agricultural society, right? Just to, to speak things that nobody understands. That's the good. That's what we're talking about the gentry. That's what the gentleman did. That's what's useful. But most of the people, they have to leave the farm to work in the city. They did not have the skills. Charles Dickens, London, was not happy. Do you remember that time? That was a miserable time. Then gradually, people shift. We began to adopt modern curriculum modern sciences into our curriculum. We began to teach them. And in the US, we had a major shift over here over the last 100 years. About the really 1950s, we caught up. We actually had a relatively very prosperous time, 50s, 60s, 70s. And until the 80s come along, we began to have trouble again. But in 1980s, we identified our trouble in the wrong way through a document called A Nation at Risk. We think it's the Japanese rising, taking us, you know, surpassing us as the problem. It's that without recognizing a new globalized economy is coming up. So where are we now? Basically, we have another economical resetting, a new economy. And what is new economy like? It's something very simple. I think you are in technology, you would know. Well, our new problem is this. So we have a new economy, and the economy is that we have a lot of shift. First of all, we see um, people like this replaced by this, right? You don't have that. And uh, then you have, uh, uh, I was uh, Michigan. Look, this is what we used to have, right? And now, this is what we have. That's number one big thing, automation. Automation has replaced a lot of, lot of jobs millions of jobs. So this is what we conclude today that is uh, has happened. And then we have another problem which we call the globalization problem. Uh, that has happened is that uh, our jobs are gone to other countries. And think about how many jobs will be lost to other countries. Okay, and so this actually is two simple factors in the age. Today we live, globalization enables jobs to be moved around any place, to lower cost place. If a job can be done for three cents in Bangladesh, it will not be done here for three dollars in the US. That's very simple. So we have to think what value are we attaching to the talent we cultivate? So what do we need? Where, where, where are we now today? The traditional middle class are people who work for Henry Ford. For a long time, we have relied on a few great people to create millions of jobs for the rest of us. And those jobs do not require tremendous creativity or actually passion. And we're joking about this. We said, now, today, we do a lot of research showing non-cognitive skills are becoming important. Resilience, collaborative skills, remember imagination. <clears throat> they say, well, none of those will be very useful. Uh, on Henry Ford's assembly line. In our assembly line, I don't need you to be collaborative. Just push the damn thing over. <laughs> that, that's it, right? Just to put the parts on, that's it. That's what we need. We don't need you kind of to, you know, resilience. That when this auto parts comes over, you have to move it. It's, just, this, it's a very different time. It's a very different time. So today, who will become the new middle class? That's the question. The new middle class has to become, has to be able to do things that cannot be outsourced or cannot be automated. This is kind of what we call jobs that can be substituted. If you look at this profession, by the way, I have to tell you, teaching is a job that cannot be substituted. So you will be here forever. <laughs> okay. And uh, you also look at it. It's, non-substitutable and high skills. That's pretty cool, right? That's in the, in the area. So look at this, what jobs can be done. So 
Well, all of this basically is saying that we are facing a new economy. You can see that working class since 1800s have been in drastic decline. You know that it grew around like 1870, industrialization, the blue line, then we began to lose them. And now we have very few people working in this area. And those skills are the place at times we created our education today. We need a lot of people with similar skills at the basic level. At the basic level. We don't need you to be extremely creative. Extremely creative people are not valuable on assembly, on assembly lines. As I've always said, Lady Gaga would be a burden on assembly line. <laughs> Can you imagine her? Really just if you, do you notice? That it's really hard. It just, it's, so we, we don't like those people. It's, so, they, so for a long time, our schools today, all our schools are designed to homogenize people, to give people the basic skills. And the skills are so basic that we can force everybody to acquire it. Remember this, you can force people to acquire basic skills. You cannot force people to be greatly creative. You see that? So that's all of the pizza scores I was celebrating you. It's not great. No, no matter what people talk about the pizza is, it is a test. If it is a test, it is a process of forcing you to give back the answers the authorities want. It's called compliance. That's basically what we've done. It's homogenized compliance in this process. So our education job have always been about homogenized people. A few subjects, we define what are valuable. So this is the, the traditional model of education is to shrink in those people. And the, the model looks something like this. It's a, it's a sausage making process, basically. That uh, we try to like, make sausages. And look at this. This is, the, this is the traditional education model. This is the model, no child left behind, race to the top, common core is trying to improve. You know, we, we, we basically begin education by defining what our children need. I mean, those things, three subjects, two subjects, whatever it is, we define the, sub, the curriculum. And once we define that, we make schools to deliver that. Technology has been asked to make that more efficient. That, that's all we're trying to do, fix this. Same people with similar skills in the end to fit in the existing jobs called employee driven. We want the employees, which is nothing wrong. Remember I was showing you, we had a society that required employees, people with the similar skills take those jobs. And but this model relied on several things that don't work anymore. First of all, it relied on the idea, you can actually make a good guess of what employees you need. Uh, Joseph Stalin tried that in Soviet Union, remember that? We're still trying to do the same thing. We'll get a bunch of kind of jo Joseph Stalins at the Common Core to say, I can make a guess how many of you need, people we need. We're planning, we're doing intele intellectual planning. Do you guys know that we're actually basically making a guess? In 25, you will need this skills, this knowledge, this talents. Most of the Common Core people basically ignore what technology has done. We're thinking it's going to do the same thing. So in my village, you could predict what knowledge you need. There will still be water buffaloes. Well, they actually they were wrong. We are no, have no water buffaloes anymore. And so we have no, nothing to take care of. And that's, that's, number two is that not only you can predict, you also have to be able to impose or instill that knowledge on everybody. Remember, that means people do not fight against you. So in a, good, in a so more homogenized society like Finland, like China, easier to do this because people are more likely to be homogenous. The kind of homogenous culture, it's easier to do. And in, in a diverse society, it's very hard to do. It's, and number three, you can also bet as a nation that all this group of people with this kind of knowledge will help this country to be great, which is easy to do in a small country like Singapore, like Finland, four million, five million people. They actually could rely on a few great ideas. Not America. One Nokia is not going to make America great. Do you see that? that that's, that's our problem. You can't do it. It's a, Finland can actually rely on a few industries and be great. Not here. It's, it's a, you know, Finland can, uh, Finland can deal with reindeer or something.
This uh, is not working very well. I, I think my voice is uneven, but uh, I'm going to speak like this. Uh, now, uh, the, finally, with that model is that you have to say, you have to have a great system that agrees that these are good things to do this. But this model is the one we've been pursuing. Based on this model, America as a nation has done poorly. You know, uh, because we, this model's best judgment is test scores in a few subjects. No, I guess it, no matter what the PISA claims to be, it's testing in three subjects. And those three subjects, no matter how great you are, are not going to make you great. And plus, more importantly, this is changing. And the change part, as I showed you, kids not, in their, in, out, of, not out of their parents' basement. The college is wrong, because college is trying to make the same guess. You, as an electric engineer, you will be able to do this. You, as a, I don't know, a chemist, you will need this. And all of bets were off. They were wrong. So what's happening now in America, we got another half of our college students who are employed are not doing jobs that require a college education. Do you guys know this? Such a waste. It's maybe not a waste. We, America today can boast the best educated bartenders and taxi drivers. <laughs> Should be very happy about that. That's, that, that's very good. That's a, but that's mismatching. We call this talent mismatch. We have so many college graduates without jobs. But at the same time, we have a shortage of talents in every country. In the US, but I think over 10 million jobs on field. In China, you know, can't believe China, 7 million college students, so many people. China's big problem is talent shortage. Europe, European countries too. So that's the same thing. So all of these miserable things come to one point. We're still trying to produce sausages when we need bacon. <laughs> that's the new middle class. Back to the idea of a new middle class. This is our job for education. <laughs> the new middle class is the creative class is the people who are able to imagine things, to create some new ideas. So this is uh, the rise of the creative class. <coughs> Excuse me. So the purple line, the creative. Well, you know this. Everybody is born creative. We know for sure. For everybody is born. That's our nature. We are creative. And, but creativity is easily suppressed. You can still remain cognitively creative, but you learn not to be creative because it's not beneficial to you. It's, it's, if you, as society, does not reward creativity, you don't want to be. Also, creativity itself is not valuable unless it's disciplined. Now, imagine in our schools, how often do we encourage creativity? We actually don't. You know, in our schools, you know, at best, we put up with those guys. You know, but, but at most, it's just uh, we, we actually try to actively suppress creative people. And uh, they, uh, some of the, this, it's actually quite nice. It was uh, shown. So, you know, kids like this, you, you, you never like them. It's, uh, you know, you say, well, Johnny, please, you know, that's, that's nice of you. If another would say, just go home, you know, that's worse. It's, that's what we do. We, we, we are all creative, but we, we suppress creativity very much. And uh, creativity as a concept was not even written about until now, after the 1920s. Do you play with Ingram you know, on, on Google? It's a beautiful way of talking about concept. If you, you can do a lot of research. So this is Google, five million books. They did not write about creativity until after 1920s. And, but we've been writing a lot about children. You compare the books about children versus the books about creativity, it's very little about creativity. You know? And so we, we don't talk about creativity. And we suppress them. We, we actively suppress them. And the better you are at instructing the common ideas to students, the better you are at suppressing creativity. It's basically because creativity is diversity, right? Creativity, by definition, is deviation. It's different from others. It's something that doesn't go according to your plan. That's called creativity. And in our schools, you know, American schools traditionally had a much better, more relaxed environment for creativity. But then it's looked at by parents, by school board members, by business people as very messy. You know, your classes were, were messy. 
once. And you're wasting time on supporting children's soft heart. I, I remember one of the criticisms launched against American teachers is that uh, when you talk about uh, math, first grade math, it's a good example, that uh, you, you, you ask a child, say, okay, Mary, what's one plus one? If Mary says, one plus one is three. You know, American teachers, most American teachers would say, Mary, that's a very interesting answer. Can you say more about that? <laughs> that we call a supportive teacher who is trying to cultivate creativity. But now, that example has been used by many American businesses and policymakers to mock American teaching. To say, our American teachers do not care about our children's math problems. We pander to her, you know, soft heart. But no, that's actually creativity, supporting that. However, in our schools, generally, we, we stifle creativity. We, uh, we, we, don't do a, we do a horrible job, actually. But we do a very effective job in uh, uh, making people not so creative. Our children come to our schools when they're age five, but 98% of them are creative at the genius level. When they come to age 10, after five years in our schools, we can successfully get rid of 60% of those guys. And uh, age 15, 10% are left. Uh, and it's getting worse. It's actually get, get, gets worse. We, we get to about, uh, um, I forgot I can move this thing. <laughs> Whew. Oh, this is so good. This is how you are conditioned by other stuff, right? Thinking, it's a, I thought I had to stick and move over there. Now I can carry this. Whew. Now, by the time you reach age 44, our age, 2% are creative. You know, that's why a lot of times, as adults, we're so impressed with somebody saying, wow, he's so creative. He's such an out-of-the-box thinker. That's not creative at all. You still have a box. You know, you, if you think outside the box, you're still thinking about the box. <laughs> so that's not, you know, true creative, we have no box. But anyway, so we, we, we become, well, uh, you, your hope comes back after retirement. After retirement, creativity does bounce back. Steve, you got hope? Well, just an example, I was thinking about, uh, do you guys know this? President George Bush is now painting. Yes. If he, I actually saw some of his paints. Did you see him in the bathtub bathroom of himself? Yeah, yeah look himself in the mirror. But anyway, so the point is that if George Bush can learn to paint, you have hope uh, your creativity does come back. So actually, which only shows one thing. Cognitively, our creativity, we never lose it. But we learn social and emotion not to do it. So we suffer. Now, when the new middle class has to be the creative class, what does that mean? It means creativity is a necessity. But our schools are not prepared to do that. Today we're still competing with other countries, with other schools to say how successful we are at homogenizing people, at suppressing creativity. That's the, that's the problem today. No child behind or, or risk to talk. All of your accountability measure, all of these things, we're all measuring cognitive skills that may or may not matter near as much as other things. Today, when information is everywhere, we're still measuring how successful you are at transmitting knowledge. That's actually the, the wrong thing about technology. Part. We are not using technology right. Then we have another type of middle class rising. Another type of middle class is people, well, basically, traditionally, useless people who have become useful. That's another new type of middle class. Uh, think uh, Kim Kardashian. It's a good example. Uh, uh, Kardashians. You know the Kardashians? You've watched those guys? Okay. The Kardashians are actually a very good example of thinking about the new generation of middle class. You may not like uh, Kim Kardashian, but she is out of her parents' basement. <laughs> she might have built her parents' basement. <laughs> now, this is a real story. I tell the story all the time because I'm so proud. She's the only celebrity I've met in my life. And, but I don't even have met me. I don't think she met me, but I met her. It's a, it's a, we're just, you know, we were co-present at one place, that's all. Uh, that's, that's all. Uh, that's, that's, 
but I claim I've met her. I said, that's, that's fine. You know, I, was, uh, I also was in a hotel in, in Melbourne, Australia. Seriously, was, uh, I was in an elevator. Uh, they call it lift over there. And uh, they, uh, they said, Kim is here. I was kicked out of the elevator. I was unhappy. I look at a lot of people in the lobby waiting to get her autograph, all this kind of thing. So, so I talked to my, my, my daughter. And uh, I talked to my, this is my daughter. So I talked to my daughter. <laughs> Uh, she is 15. She is my great pop culture consultant. And uh, so I said, who is this Kim person? And uh, daughter said, yeah, that's uh, probably Kim Kardashian. I said, why are people following her? She said, well, she's a celebrity. I said, a celebrity for what? Uh, my daughter said, nothing. You know, so I, said, I, I, I want you to think, reflect on this nothingness. When nothing has become valuable, what does it mean? There's actually no difference. We're talking about the undervalued talents have become valuable. We may not like her at all. I mean, do you think when, when Shakespeare <coughs> was writing his stuff, how many English peasants thought that was useful? Very few. Seriously, so think about this thing called nothingness. So look at the rise of the nothing. We, music, art, how many by the way, how many cooking shows do you guys now watch? <laughs> Is that valuable talents? We have moved away from the society of necessity to the society of abundance, where we consume very different talents. I look at one example recently called nothingness. is uh, food. The talents involved in producing food. I came from the village age of necessity, where we really spend all our energy trying to get food. In America, we spend very little energy on getting the food. We spend a lot more energy and resources on convincing people that they should eat. Do you notice that? You watch uh, TV commercials about food, billboards, and actually go, go, go try to go to the uh, grocery store. How many types of cereal you see there? You need a cereal consultant to tell you what to buy. <laughs> Why do we have those things? I mean, I, I first came to America in 1995. I go to grocery store. Uh, you don't have this trouble. I try to buy shampoo. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, I had to buy shampoo. I didn't know what to buy because I did not know what type of hair I had. <laughs> do you know? You guys know that. Right? They have oil in the hair and all this. It's, it's, I said, now I have to go to ask somebody my, my hair type. That's consulting. It's called, it's, no. Look at the food industry. We have we, the talent involved in producing food commercials is what? Nothing to do with farming. And we spend more money there. I was talking to some guy, Fredo Lay. He said, he's going to lose his job after 30 years as a factory manager. I said, why? He said, well, now. Every bag of our thing has a barcode, a chip. When it goes off the shelf, the computer system, globalized system, automatically tells the factory to place orders on what raw materials, to what to make. So as a store, he was great. He has no job. I said, oh, what, what, who has jobs? And I said, people who manipulate flavors, flavors, invent new flavors. And the people who try to manipulate psychology said, when to decide what flavor of bags of chips we should pull off, store for three years, do not release. Then we do a big release. And they do contests. In the social media, they manage to people to, to, to invent flavors, to submit flavors. Can you can't imagine those things. Nothing to do with calories. When you go to Boston, the more money you pay, the less food you get in the restaurants. <laughs> What's that about? Right? It's, uh, think about all those. And use, what are you paying? You're paying service, decor. You know, the, the feeling of those things. And uh, they are, the other thing to think about is this. Then after you, you've eaten, and we got another billion dollar industry to help you lose what you just eat. <laughs> it's about nothingness. We have come to, I, I was kind of nothingness. It's basically talking about the psychological, cultural, spiritual, and personalized consumption. In the age of abundance, we are consuming things that's very personalized. That has to do with your psychological and spiritual needs a lot more. So that's something that we have not come to 
recognize we are still treating those talents as peripheral, as distraction. We no school today actively, deliberately cultivate that. You know, we have how many art schools we have? How many programs arts have been cut? Uh, by the way, I, I, I was talking to this art person last night in Chicago. I said, don't think art education is automatically creative. Art education can be the most effective way to kill your creativity in arts. You know that, the same thing. Teaching math doesn't mean you're going to become mathematical and creative either. You know, that's the kind of things. However, we have undervalued those traditional talents. So that's the second group of our, I call, new middle class. The first one is creative. The second is undervalued. The other way to think about this undervalued is to, for you to think this way. In the 21st century, in the most abundant nation, the United States, we can safely bet every talent is valuable. If Lady Gaga is useful, anyone can be useful. That's, we have to accept that. It's a, that but now we, we don't like to accept that. We're still thinking one type. We're still thinking, you know, uh, you know, the Matt Coleman you know, can, can decide the common core. This is bad. No, they're wrong. Uh, but there's another catch. Creative, undervalued talent, everybody can be valuable. They have to become great and entrepreneurial. Because today, just mediocre, be like somebody else, will not get there. We got 7 billion people competing for some space. You have to be inventing something great. But today, because our traditional homogeneous approach, we actually try to produce mediocre people. An A is not great. By the way, when people talk about high expectations, getting an A is not great. Get a 2400 on the SAT has nothing to do with greatness. Basically means you have been very good at complying with somebody else. That, that's all it is, right? It's just, it's nothing great. True greatness, truly rigorous demand expectations to be better than yourself. That's what an inventor, an entrepreneur should be. So all of this come over, so we need to create job creators, not job seekers. So now come back to some kind of ending, summary. What kind of education do we need? And where, what can technology do? Well, we need to push to a, a different kind of education, that education that tries to do something very simple. Number one, it has to come to the idea that education is about making everybody great. It is about expanding human talents. So I want to ask your, you, when a child comes to your school, can you make him or her better than he or she is today in her own terms, not in terms of government mandates? That's actually your biggest job. Can you make this, if this person wants to say, I am interested in, I don't know, um, making something, can you make me better at doing that? Not trying to say, no, no, don't make that thing, that's silly, make my thing. You know, when we have this debate with people at Common Core, people say, you know, any creativity has to be supported by knowledge, which is almost true. The trouble is that, do you teach the knowledge first, or do you encourage them to create and seek the knowledge? Today, our common core idea is called the just-in-case idea. Just in case you want to make something, study this. They forgot. By the time you've, taught, you've finished teaching this thing, they've kind of lost interest in creating something. You know, a lot of good teaching comes at the cost of individual interest. I'll give you a good example. This is uh, when people now, you know, we look at the PISA scores, uh, top 10 countries. Uh, Finland, by the way, is not of interest anymore, just in case. Okay, it's, uh, she, it's returned to, to its normalcy, you know. Even Pazzi Solberg has moved to Harvard. Do you know Pazzi Solberg? The guy who wrote the Finnish lessons, he, he's been uh, representing the Finnish education. He came to Harvard already now, so just so. He can, he's abandoned Finland. But Finland has been locked. Finland has been out of top 10 now. Finland has been out of top 10 on the math. And who got there? So uh, people were talking about, how did Finland lose? Is Finland education getting worse? And no, 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 I said, it's more Asian countries got in. There are the top 10 countries, eight are Asian countries. Four of them are Chinese entities. 
Shanghai, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau, plus Vietnam, Japan, Singapore, Korea. That's it. It's a, but Asian countries, I was going to give the example. How do you do that? There was a kid, a ninth grader uh, in Chongqing, where I'm from, who was writing a great novel. It's a great novel. Friends like it. But his father and his teacher said, son, please, you got to prepare for this test. You have all your life to write this novel when you get old. After passing this test, after college, you know, can you imagine after college you still have interest in writing this novel? You've lost it. Do you say, well, that's, that's what happens there. So we need a model like this. And what does this model inc include? This is what uh, I will encourage you to do, and this is what I will talk about at the breakout session. So the three elements of a new paradigm. A new paradigm, number one, is that the what? The curriculum or the educational experiences should not be prescribed by somebody, but start from the child. Children autonomy, personalized learning. That is, uh, you, you know, every child should have personalized education pathway. And technology is the best way to realize that. Is the best way to realize that. Not the big data learning analytics stuff. Those are basic and new kind of uh, BF Skinner's learning machines. You know, those still are prescribed by what I want to learn. The what should be driven by a student. Remember, everybody should be useful and valuable. Number two, we should seriously implement product-oriented learning, not project-based learning. The big difference, because project-based learning can be misused. We have a lot of projects done, but they're not valuable. I want children today to return to the nature of learning. The natural learning is about children want to learn something because they want to produce something. Creativity is joy. You know, be able to create something is actually happiness. That's human nature. Do you guys realize when you discover something new in your house, how happy you were? Human means genetically we're programmed to enjoy the propagation of ourselves. One is produce, reproducing genes, and another is reproducing memes. Memes are ideas. It's very powerful. But they have to mix stuff. How do we make product? Products have to serve a purpose. Technology, again, expands the potential consumers of our students' products. Your students can be writing books for Chinese kids. You can be running a language, global language school teaching English to immigrant children, to anybody. It's product. And finally, all of this has to happen in a globalized context. That is, today's education, there's no reason to confine our children to the four walls of our buildings. So just to end with this, Technology should not be measured by its ability to help you to transmit more efficiently of knowledge prescribed by somebody else to our students. Technology should do two things very well. Number one is to serve as a beautiful tool, a less expensive tool for students to create. And technology should do another thing. It is to offer a more abundant more diverse global opportunities for our students to interact with others, to bring expertise in. There's two things have always been on the minds of, of you guys, but they have been distorted because of the other people are messing with this thing. So continue to blame Bush and Obama, but we are going to try to make this paradigm shift. And this paradigm shift has to happen because it's very dangerous in this, right now in this country. Not only dangerous for our students, you can see those students stay in our basements, but as a nation. If this nation begins to lose creativity, invention, and diversity of talents, that's going to be very dangerous. You know, next time we go to the uh, Supreme Court, we have all this protection, equal opportunity. We talk about uh, gender, uh, and we talk about country of origin, race. Those are protected. Remember those people? Nobody protects that diversity of talents. This country has a lot of discrimination against talents. And we allow that to happen. Now, if you happen to be good at what I want you to do, you're a good student. Otherwise, you go to special ed. <laughs> that, that's what we do. But remember this one. Talents is redefined. We live in a beautiful society where every talent can be valuable plus some ethics. That's what we need. So. I want to end this and uh, just to, uh, with one thing. If you can help every child to grow in their own way, in a joyful, curious way, they will stay out of your basement. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.